we're constantly setting up little uh, barriers uh, that would impede uh, a threat actor from being able to figure out all the different types of defenses we have. And I think we have eight different you know, methods in the infrastructure that we use. Sounds like you have a, a lot of layers they, that yes. sort of combine in order to implement that. Yes. Layers much like an ogre or I an onion gonna... <laughs> or a parfait. <laughs> Is cybersecurity a parfait? I think it might be. Oh my gosh. Sometimes it's an onion though. Everybody loves parfait. Everybody loves parfaits. Certificates, onion. <laughs> cybersecurity with parfait. hopper. Parfait. There you have it. Parfait. <laughs> it's perfect. With, with a cherry on top. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in, as we do in the digital age. Uh, my name is Stephanie Pfeiffer, CTO of EITR Technologies, and I am with Nicholas Hughes, CEO of EITR Technologies. And today on our podcast, we are joined by Tom McNamara, who is CEO and founder of Hopper. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, Tom? Sure. So I'll start with uh, talking just a minute about Hopper. So Hopper is a cybersecurity technology company, and we're located in Columbia, Maryland. Um, we started hmm, seven years ago and uh, with a uh, innovation that we hope will help businesses and people be more secure and private in our digital society. Uh, I personally have a 40 plus year career in national security and technology and science and technology stuff. Um, and that's once it gets to a certain point, don't you just sort of like say like a lot of years? <laughs> yeah, but you know, the older I get, the f I find that mo more people respect me if I say how many years. It's like, <laughs> wow, man, that guy is that guy's got a lot of years. I better not argue with him or interrupt him in the video. You know, if he's on a I'm really bad at interrupting people, so I apologize. Yeah, you're with the two wrong people. Here. Yeah, he, he may not last the the uh, podcast if I interrupt. Him. <laughs> but I have uh, been in around technology an awful lot for many years. That's awesome, and you have a really cool new product that's coming to market. It's been featured in the Gartner Review, which is really exciting. So we're excited to have you here today to talk a little bit about the future of cybersecurity and sort of where you see that going. So I guess sort of jumping on that, how do you see Hopper adapting to the trends that you're seeing in cybersecurity today? I think we're trying to um, deal with a a lot of things in, in cybersecurity. Um, nation state threats, um, criminal threats, and uh, and now, you know, with the uh, things like chat GPT, artificial intelligence and machine learning coming out, you know, just what those kinds of technologies are gonna do to be able to break through some of the security features we have or even help us uh, enhance our ability in some other areas. So I think those are going to be really interesting things to watch over the years. I was talking to a, another analyst who may not have had 40 years of uh, <laughs> experience, but close to it. And he, he worked uh, on information security back in the uh, Cold War days. And he said it was a lot easier back then because they kind of knew who the threat was and they knew the methods and the tactics and now there are so many different ways and so many different avenues that uh, attacks can come so it's a it's a really uh, very difficult environment to try yeah. to achieve protection in. I mean the the threat vectors themselves are there's so much more now than there used to be but the speed of everything is really what, what gets me you know everything's changing so quickly and um, you know, bad actors are facilitated by all of these new uh, technological processes that were never around before. They can automate their entire um, discovery process and, you know, maybe implement a bunch of, uh, you know, different automated methods in order to, to get into organizations uh, through known means. And so really, it's just like the the things that take longer are the the new methods that are harder to to say like oh here's my bag of tricks let me pull one out and uh, and you know pop this organization security yeah and then there's the zero days right every time we do a an upgrade a new feature every time a, a new 
service comes out, there's always that chance that there's a zero day sitting in there that could Absolutely. be really uh, damaging. Yeah, I think I think zero is pretty on trend right now because you hear a lot about <laughs> zero trust, zero day. And, you know, with Hopper sort of revolutionizing some of the MTLS and certificate based things that we have to do um, in architectures today, I kind of wanted to get your opinion on how Hopper is aligning with that zero trust mentality or if you're just blowing it out of the water and making something new. I think we're kind of on the a stage of blowing it out of the water, you know, it uh, because so much of our infrastructure is dependent upon um, asymmetric cryptography and PKI certificates and TLS and MTLS. They're all kind of one family of security solutions that have been very robust and very um, widely used for, you know, for decades. And Yet the day is coming when we know those are going to uh, fail because of Absolutely. quantum quantum computing and uh, and and so we see you know a need to start transitioning now to things that aren't so sensitive. Uh, the security solutions aren't so sensitive to those things. So we've done a, a pretty ambitious job of of trying to come up with a cybersecurity method that would still achieve the same levels of security of identity trust uh, actually better identity trust because it's verifiable which in a lot of automated certificates solutions they're just pumping out the certificates to be able to give machines say in the wor workloads in the cloud you know a, a certificate so they can set up an mtls connection or a tls connection but we really look at the importance of well who are they giving that to yeah. And there's not a chain of trust there in that identity, then you don't have zero trust. Yeah, that, that that's one of the things that really, um, I guess, stands out to me, especially in Kubernetes environments, where you know you have something like Cert Manager that has uh, a centralized, um, you know, private CA that's just sort of like made up on the fly, right? Um, and it's Cert Manager's job to really just like hand out certificates for anybody that asks for them, and you know, at that point, there, there's really no identity to be had. Uh, all it's really doing is ensuring end-to-end -end encryption um, between two endpoints within the cluster. Uh, you know, it, it, you have this shared CA and you have a bunch of workloads that are all, um, you know, running certificates. Well, if a pod goes down and comes back up, um, if that certificate isn't persisting or maybe the certificate is expired, um, it needs to be redone. There's no chain between that old identity and the new one, right? right. It's just like it's another workload in but, the stack, and there's no way to say like this used to be that. Right, right. There's no uh, there's no history, right? Everything right. gets an entirely new credential without a connection back to whatever it had before. And so what we've been able to do is figure out a way to actually use the workload history to create uh, essentially what we call a machine alias identity credential that can be persisted over time and rotates over time so that we're able to say this workload is this workload because we know where it's been and who it's talked to, et cetera, over time. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, as someone that's come from the development environment into DevOps, and discovered the nuances of certificates. I have a big respect for what you're doing because one, I hate certificates <laughs> and I would love to never have to deal with them again. And I think it just leaves you so wide open to, you know, who you actually trust. Like, why is my CA this large? I know I don't trust all those people. Right. I trust like seven people. Right. With, uh, with PKA implementations in general, I don't think Stephanie is alone in uh, saying that they're terrible and, uh, you know, <laughs> difficult, you know, that's like the number one question that I get all the time, uh, when I'm working with, uh, folks that are, you know, developers or operations folks. Um, and they, it's just so many moving pieces and so much complexity that, that goes yes. into it, that it's just, it's, it's really hard for folks to understand sometimes. And when things go wrong, uh, you know, figure out what exactly is wrong and troubleshoot it. Yeah. And I worry sometimes that all of that friction, all of that difficulty and complexity, one, it requires you to have a much more skilled person doing it. And there's fewer and fewer of them. Plus it, it can inhibit the actual use of MTLS or TLS because someone's just going to say, look, I, 
I can't do it. It's too hard. I'm taking too much time. I'm going to get this thing out there. I'll worry about it later. And then it never gets addressed. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you had mentioned how you automatically rotate the identity. And I think that that's really smart in terms of what we're moving towards in the future. Um, so I kind of wanted to get your opinion on the moving target defense in modern cybersecurity. You know, how does Hopper's platform address that evolving cyber threat? Yeah, we're real excited about the whole uh, defensive strategy of, of moving target defense and an automated moving target defense, uh, particularly for the cloud and workloads. The It's such a simple strategy to... Uh, I love simple things. Yeah, me, me too. too. <laughs> Jinx. Our, our brains are too full of t complex things. Yeah. But it's a simple strategy because you don't have to know a lot of details about the adversary. You're just trying to outmaneuver them, move faster than they can, and leave them frustrated. Mm -hmm. And so we've figured out a way that we can rotate both the identity credential, like we were talking about, plus the secret, you know, the two credentials that you need to, um, you know, for that workload to sort of be trusted. We can rotate both of them at a high frequency and actually be able to verify those entities when they connect to one another. Yeah, the, the secret rotation part uh, is, is really super valuable to me um, because, you know, we work with a ton of different organizations and secret management and secret rotation is, is difficult. Um, and a lot of times the rotation just doesn't get done because it's, it's so hard for folks to implement some automation strategy in order to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of times there's the, the pieces that you can throw together to, to make it work. Um, but, uh, maybe the, the applications themselves don't play nicely with that. Right. Um, so ha having a built in strategy in order to rotate secrets really, um, on a, a much faster basis than, than we've ever really seen before, uh, is, is really cool. Yeah. And you mentioned, you know, the applications not working well with sort of traditional secrets rotation. And one reason for that is those. The traditional approach is to use those secrets as an authentication credential. Well, to get that to work, you have to, if you rotate it, say, in your vault, mm -hmm. then you have to get it, the authentic version of it, over to the application so that when you present that secret, to the, your client presents that secret to the, uh, to the app or whatever, the database, that there's an authentic copy of it there to be authenticated. And one of the things we realized is there's a lot of uh, uh, pathways where that secret can be uh, observed and, and taken. There's additional API keys involved that have mm -hmm. to be stored as well. It's kind of a headache. And so we decided that, hey, let's not pass the secret that we're rotating at high frequency. Let's not pass that anywhere. Let's just keep it right there with the workload Smart. and use it as a encryption key. Mm -hmm. And so that was that's part of our, our uh, approach is we don't use secrets that have to be passed or have to be inserted or injected into an application endpoint, which is nice. Yeah, you know, the, the protection of uh, symmetric secrets um, insofar as like they, they need to be on either side of a transaction um, is, is a tough, tough thing, right? You know, I, I've recalled, um, you know, specific instances in the past where people maybe had symmetric uh, keys for, you know, VPNs between two points or something like that. Um, and they actually had to deploy a person to the remote site in order to, you know, enter that secret and uh and things like that are, are expensive and you know it's it's difficult in transit you know with a person um to to keep things safe and certainly it, not gonna it, certainly not gonna work at the speed of the cloud that way yeah exactly it's, it's what really if hard in, like tropical destinations that i want to go to well i mean there is that we right? should probably keep this technology away from yeah. those <laughs> so i could still get my travel yeah. in yeah. <laughs> i'm sure there are governments in the world that would uh, still allow you to travel for that reason. excellent excellent okay just making sure those yeah. are i gotta hit the on button first so like you gotta bring me out there i'll try to hit the yeah. on button and then we'll be good and i'll say for about a week yeah yeah because yeah. it's tropical you, you gotta monitor it yeah, yeah. i gotta yeah. make sure it works yeah 
<laughs> That's awesome. So we've been talking about this technology, and I want to make sure that we're talking about what I think we're talking about. It's the codes hidden in plain sight is our secrets rotation that we're talking about. Yes. Yeah, so Chips. I love the, out, the acronyms. They're so good. Tom yeah. loves acronyms. He does. <laughs> yeah, chips are uh, great to eat, and they're great for cybersecurity, <laughs> too. Agree. So uh, chips, codes hidden in plain sight was an idea that was kind of just an epiphany um, seven or eight years ago. I woke up one morning thinking, wouldn't it be neat if we could take all of this random information that's constantly changing across the Internet and in some way use that to help us be more secure. So almost kind of like a self-protecting, self-healing thing where the internet helps give you the data that you need to be secure. And so we started that out with a thing actually called password hopping, where we were gonna try to do that with people's passwords to make it easier so they don't have to remember a password, they just have to remember a formula. And every day we'd send them an email, mm -hmm. they'd be able to look at that email, it looks like a normal email with some news headlines on it, but they would know a specific word on that email was important to them as their password for the day. Fast forward across a whole bunch of years and we decided that that approach could be used more effectively uh, without a lot of usability problems if it were done in the cloud with machines. Of course, machines are a lot, uh, a lot more capable of doing things quickly. They have memory, which you know, as yeah, I don't, don't have that. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm losing gone. mine too. Yeah. <laughs> so We've adapted that same uh, concept to what we're doing now uh, with machines uh, and, and workloads so that, you know, because I, I know I mentioned a few minutes ago that we were rotating secrets at a high frequency and we were using them for encryption. Well, like you pointed out, is you have to get the key to the other end. The tropical destination has to have the key. Non-tropical so destinations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the non-tropical destinations have to have the key. So how do you get the key there? And so this is where the chips technology comes in is we've uh, figured out how to build an algorithm that if it runs at the same time in two different locations, anywhere in the world, it'll produce the identical key. And so we can set up this encrypted tunnel between those two locations on demand without ever having a handshake or a key exchange. And the, the way that's done with chips is those two endpoints have to have, quote, their handshake way, way, way back in time at the beginning when they trust each other, they share that algorithm with each other. And so now they have that algorithm and they have no idea what the algorithm is going to produce because what chips does is it goes out to the Internet, grabs all of that dynamic data from wherever the algorithm says it should go and whatever it says it should grab grabs it all, puts it through a standard or a uh, widely accepted and trusted AES uh, encryption library. So we're not doing anything new with cryptography. Mm -hmm. It's well accepted cryptography. And, but the seed that goes into that is what's um, allowing that uh, cryptographic library to, to generate the identical symmetric keys. That's really fascinating. Yeah, but that that concept just by itself is is huge in my eyes, right? Like there's such broad applicability yeah. to so many different use cases. Um, you know, I, I guess that that begs the question, right? Like, you know, with that core technology, you know, what kinds of things uh, can you do with that now, and and what kinds of things you know could you see happening with that in the future? Yeah, from, from our point of view, you know, we're just a, a small uh, startup right now, and we're trying to get uh, the word out about the technology and what we do and get people to use the technology and sort of experience it. Um, so we give it away for free, you know, for a limited amount of volume so that uh, DevOps like yourselves, developers can, can use it and understand what its capabilities are. But we're looking at it primarily to help protect APIs right now. That's kind of our, our go-to-market target because APIs are under such significant uh, attack. They're just a, a very lucrative target for threat actors to try to steal data, to damage uh, corporations, to move laterally, et cetera. So the man-in-the-middle attack, the insider attack, those are all places that are high-value uses of, uh, of our technology. 
The other thing I think that is short, right behind that would be Internet of Things devices. You know, that whole market of of every do, everything we have is going to be connected or is connect on its way to being connected mm -hmm. in the cloud and just being able to protect those endpoints, even industrially. So things like the um, Colonial Pipeline thing, which was which was not a uh, device so much a device thing is a billing and accounting problem but you know we don't want those types of things to hit our critical infrastructure yeah absolutely um, you know there's a lot of initiatives right now for um, like smart city programs mm -hmm. connected grid programs and things like that um, I think it was just what like late last year or something like that there was a bill that you know came out and uh, for the federal government allocated a bunch of money um, to, to protect the um, you know, electrical grid and you know, other industrial systems um, in the US and you know, utilizing your type of technology to, to protect those systems sounds like it would be a really good idea because you, know, you have these, um, I don't know, they're devices, I guess, that, that are just in places that uh, have to be broadly accessible, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're not going to be able to lock them down in a data center. Right. Um, and, you know, have, you know, two person access and things like that, right? Like, you know, um, you know physical security is very difficult in, in those types of uh, use cases. So having um, some sort of technology that is, it sounds like you could just, you know, grab the device and, and bring it, you know, lift it out of there and you're still not going to know exactly what the, the secret is that it was using to talk back because it's constantly moving and changing. Right. Right. The, um, you know, the nice thing about chips as well is it, it's not a lot of code. You know, it's really a, a lightweight piece of code, a small package that's um, so it can work in disadvantaged environments, low power environments uh, where you, there's not a lot of memory or there's not a lot of uh, uh, energy to be able to do a whole lot of processing, things like that. It, you know, it needs a little bit of connectivity to the Internet, but everything's connected to the Internet. So <laughs> my, my dishwasher is connected to the Internet. <laughs> and I'm sure the dishes are cleaner because of it. Yep, absolutely. Because it's probably monitoring your water temperature and everything else. <laughs> I get a little notification on my television that my dishwasher's done. Now you're going to get hacked. Yeah. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Yeah. Why don't you tell us the brand and the model number of your... Uh, Will do. Okay. <laughs> Can we also get your social security and credit card? Yeah. Here, no hold on. Uh, I'll hold up my uh, license for the, Thanks. the folks at That'd home. That'd be great. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so I guess that's a... An interesting topic I'm going to ask you right now is like I said, I was the developer, right? And I've come at Dev DevOps from that sort of perspective of a developer. And after I hit a certain point of like, you know, certificates being a pain and security being a pain, I kind of just want to find my way around it. So what is the importance of encrypting tunnels? What is the importance of that? Like, why is it so important that I pay attention to this type of security? Yeah, I think... Um you know, like everything in cybersecurity, we learn more and more over time about how far an attacker will go and how sophisticated they can be. And, you know, if you think back, um, it wasn't too long ago when we, some of the earliest uh, e-commerce sites, I think even PayPal and some others didn't have uh, transport layer security. So when you went to log on, you could just transact business over HTTP and and then a lot of people you know got hacked and there were data breaches data breaches and then we got TLS or I think it was it TLS first or something was before TLS but it got better and better and then we ended up getting MTLS for the two-way kind of thing so we've learned that encryption matters because adversaries have a way of just being able to sniff traffic, uh, whether it's wireless traffic, whether it's you know wired traffic, whether it's inside the cloud, outside the cloud, they can sniff it, they can monitor it, they can read it. And so encryption is so important to making them blind 
all they can know is there's a there's something flowing here, and they might know an endpoint or, an, or another endpoint, but it really keeps them from sniffing a lot of stuff. And for the longest time, we thought, great, we'll do that in the outside world, but inside our enterprise, you know, we've got really good perimeter security. We're going to be safe. And so they didn't necessarily encrypt everything in on premises. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to go through all of the hassles and frictions you were talking about with certificates, et cetera. And then in December 2020, right, we heard about the solar winds hack and everyone really woke up and saw how how an advanced persistent threat could actually be inside some of the biggest software companies and cybersecurity companies and enterprise suppliers of software for months without being detected and, and sort of the the lights came on and everybody realized, no, we now we have to encrypt everything inside the the network too, but it's still really hard to do that. Yeah, I, I think that there was, you know, a small push for it earlier on than that, right? You know, a couple of years or, or so uh, where people were really starting to ramp up with the thought of zero trust. But, it, you know, it's a term that's not really solidified. You right. know, how people get to zero trust uh, depends largely on the, the definition that a particular organization is using. Um, and, you know, I, I was in our first uh, our first podcast where, you know, we talked about with John that perimeter security really leaves the GUI center of, mm, of the network yes. open. <laughs> um, and so, you know, leaving the GUI center open, um, people recognized that there was an issue with that. Um, but nobody was really leaping forward and saying, like, here's how we solve this problem. You know, here here's what zero trust means. Here's how, you know, we we implement this within our organizations. You know, some some of the big players like Microsoft and such um, were, were starting to define that. Right. Like, um, you know, Microsoft came up, I think it was like three bullet points, you know, with strong identity. And, right. Um, I forget exactly what the other two were, but, you know, they were like, here's a, kind of our definition of zero trust that we're moving towards. Um, and I remember seeing that in uh, at Ignite in 2019. And, uh, you know, they, they were just starting to define it and just starting to, to implement pieces of what that meant to their organization. And I'm not sure how far along they are at this point, but, you know, I think that there's still a large amount of organizations out there that that just haven't gotten this far. Right. And it's it's become a, a bloated term, zero trust, because it it's heavily been been heavily marketed and it's hard to look under the hood and say whether something is or isn't zero trust, whether the functions there are zero trust or not. I mean, we talked a little bit about the PKI certificates and automated certificates, which don't have uh, a chain of trust in the workload identities. But I think, you know, um, the principles of zero trust, the seven of them that NIST laid out are pretty good principles, but they're principles only, right? And so you have to, uh, vendors, or not vendors, but users, buyers, um, enterprises have to look deeply at what they're trying to buy and use to figure out is is this really zero trust and I've heard a lot of even some cybersecurity companies promote their solutions as zero trust but they're using self-signed certificates that never expire and it's like how can that be <laughs> so but it's so it's it it is confusing um, but the principles around it, I think, are really good. And it's essentially saying, you know, like back in the uh, Cold War days, I think it was Ronald Reagan who said, trust but verify. Um, you know, we have, to ver we have to have verification. Mm -hmm. And we should be looking for verification as being one of the things. If you're buying a cybersecurity product, you should look to see, are they verifying identity? Are they verifying other things? other things that are important to you to know that you can trust that connection. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, because zero trust taking it extremely literally, I have to trust somebody. It's yeah. not zero trust. And with the marketing that's trust out there. Trust no one. Trust no one. And I, not even me. Yeah, and I think the other <laughs> thing, you you know, like you mentioned, like the GUI center is, is, you know, for a long time, we thought we could hunt them down inside the GUI center, right? We thought we could track them, identify them, 
they had a certain behavior and, and all of that is true. But, and we've even used artificial intelligence and mach machine learning well in those kinds of environments, but there's still a, um, a latency to that because you have to teach those algorithms and then there's false alarms and false positives and, and many of those issues. So you're not gonna find, be able to find everyone, which is, goes back to the point about moving target defense. What's really elegant about moving target defense is you don't care. You're just moving and as long as you know you can move faster, it's, the problem is the adversaries to deal with. Yeah, I, th I think the other point to make, right, is that the traditional way of knowing that somebody is in your network is um, by monitoring at certain choke points, right? And, you know, a lot of organizations still don't have the level of observability on their networks True. to see things that don't traverse that choke point. So, you know, if some piece of, of code, um, you know, some workload within their organization happens to be uh, compromised and, you know, maybe somebody is now residing on that um, and the traffic to it looks legitimate, mm -hmm. um, the traffic coming off of that workload to do further discovery, if it doesn't traverse a choke point, it's not going to show up. And so, you know, you have a dwell time in that workload yes. that is unacceptable, quite frankly, while somebody's mapping out your network. Yeah, and the thing is that they're very, the adversary is very good. They they know our defenses, they, they know that technology well, and they know how to stay just under sort of the radar limit, right? And have movement and lateral movement or actions or whatever below the point of discovery. Yep. And they're pretty good at that. Yeah, and I think moving to the cloud, moving to Kubernetes, it's only getting more complicated. Um, so you mentioned how Hopper is going to rotate very quickly my credentials, which I love. Um, and then integrating that into the cloud, which is already natively very complicated, um, but not complicated enough that people shouldn't try it because <laughs> it is the best. Um, the amount of cybersecurity that's going on there and the observations that are going on there, like how does Hopper deal with real-time cybersecurity in these environments that are so complicated? So the way we have dealt with it to protect our own, uh, our own architecture, our own implementations is it's a bit of a combination of obfuscation and large numbers. So, you know, we talked about algorithms and, and in our sort of thin client sidecar that gets deployed with these workloads, we have over 42,000 algorithms in there. So, it's a lot you know, of algorithms. Yeah, have, <laughs> Hopefully have, that's automated. Have, <laughs> you know, have fun figuring out which one of them that, you know, the DevOps chose to run with their, their particular workloads. Mm -hmm. And so it's things like that that we um, sort of tried to raise the bar so that as an attacker tries to attack our technology, they run into points where they can't get all the information they need, which is one reason why, you know, the rotating identity is actually needed as well as the rotating secret to be able to have sense. a suc successful connection. But there are two different kinds of rotation frequencies mm -hmm. and two different methods. And so if you discover one, you may not discover the other. Other You have to have both of them. But even having both of them is hard because we have another um, uh, feature in our infrastructure that keeps certain things from actually being available until a certain period of time. And so we're constantly setting up little uh, barriers uh, that would impede uh, a threat actor from being able to figure out all the different types of defenses we have. And I think we have eight different you know, methods in the infrastructure that we use. Sounds like you have a, a lot of layers that, that yes. sort of combine in order to implement that. Yes. Layers much like an ogre or an onion gonna... or a parfait. <laughs> <laughs> is cybersecurity a parfait? I think it might be. Oh my gosh. Sometimes it's an onion though. Everybody loves parfait. Everybody loves parfaits. Certificates, onion. <laughs> cybersecurity with parfait. hopper, parfait. There you have it. Parfait. <laughs> it's perfect. With a cherry on top. Oh man. We're getting close to ice cream sundae at that point. Nice. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so... 
this has been really enlightening. I really like what Hopper's doing. I think it's doing a lot of novel things, and I think it's really changing the landscape for, for cybersecurity. And I would love to not know anything about certificates anymore, ever. <laughs> well, that day is coming. I love it. And uh, I hope you'll find many ways to uh, sort of implement this into your solutions and the customers that you work with will be excited about it as well. Absolutely. You know, it's a, um, it's a daunting task to think about how many, how, how large the cloud is and how many things are out there and how I'll say entrenched PKI certificates and TLS protocols, which have been very good for years have, but there comes a time when things sort of have run their time. And I think, you know, for uh, a lot of our infrastructure, quantum computing is going to come and there's going to be a time when everything we rely on with regard to PKI or PKI derivatives is, is going to have to be replaced. Yep. So hopefully this will be the replacement for it. That would be spectacular. That's yeah. awesome. Thanks for coming out and talking to us, Tom. We appreciate it. Yeah, it's um, always great to talk with you guys. E even it's though we did interrupt you quite a bit and... Uh, well, yeah, I give you our time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I tried not to interrupt as much as possible. I'll probably come back if Stephanie asked me. Perfect. <laughs> Maybe we'll do it in a tropical location. We can swap yeah. out some certificates and passwords while we're there. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks for making it to the end of the podcast. We really appreciate it. Um, thank you, Tom, from Hopper. We're excited to see where you go next. And from all of us at EITR, we'll see you later. <laughs> Have a great day.